Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emma Roberts, and I am um, the Director for Capacity Building Services at the Harm Reduction Coalition. And I am going to hopefully build on Goro's excitement, actually, because this morning, you know, we've heard an awful lot about the challenges that we're facing as harm reductionists. And um, I'm, this is my 21st year working in harm reduction, and it's my first international harm reduction conference, so I'm really excited to be here, if, if a little nervous. Um, I'm also used to training people, so I feel like we should maybe stretch and do an icebreaker right now to wake you up after lunch, so please feel free to walk around and do that if you need to. I don't have slides. I was told I had 12 minutes, and as a trainer, I usually have lots of slides, and when they said you have 12 minutes, I was like, woohoo, I don't have to speak for 12. So I didn't do slides today. Um, but what I'm going to share with you is some of our experiences of working in, um, in the US in some of the more conservative areas. I, in my really long title, uh, we said in the conservative heart, lands uh, of the US, including the Midwest, but really what I could say is the middle right, and the south of the US. And it's really interesting for me as a British person, because you can tell I'm not American, right? but I get to, I get to travel around the US um, and provide capacity building trainings with my team um, to places that have a very, very new to harm reduction. If we were to look at a map of where the harm reduction and syringe access programs are in America, you would see that all the dots are around the edges. There's very little in the middle. Uh, there may be underground programs, but they're not officially recognized. So um, what, and what happened um, two years ago, some of you will have heard the story. Um, it was around, well, it's a little over two years ago. It was around December 2013, January uh, of 2015. We got the news from Austin, Indiana, that they'd had a HIV outbreak. Now, this was not surprising to many of us because you've already heard this morning that across the US, we've seen massive increases in hepatitis C, massive increases in the rates of overdose. And on the back of that, because this is connected to an increase in injection drug use, there's this concern and this worry that we're going to see more HIV outbreaks. And it happened in Indiana. Austin is a really small community in a rural area. There's only four and a half thousand people. And to date, they've seen over 200 people develop HIV as a result of this outbreak. That's a, ma that's a, a massive challenge for this very poverty-stricken area. We went to work there. Um, it's always really interesting to me in America. They call it the city of Austin. It has one stoplight. <laughs> I'm like, how do they get to call it a city? It's like a village to me. But anyway, um, but you know, 200 people in that vicinity of 4,500, and it's in the count Scott County, which the county only has 24,000 people. And we know that Indiana is one of the states in America has the lowest public health spending per head of population as well. So there's very little resources to even provide treatment and support for people uh, in these areas. So they've been hit by this epidemic. So this news began to you know, hit the headlines. And we'd already been doing some work, capacity building work in Indiana. Uh, and then what happened is we began to be inundated at the Harm Reduction Coalition with people coming from the in and around those states. Um, Kentucky was very quick off the mark. Uh, Ohio was been in contact with us. West Virginia got in contact with us. They were like, we have, we are seeing the same conditions there that um, you know, and we think we could be on the verge of a HIV outbreak too. So they came to us and said, you know, we really need some capacity building. One of the really good things about working at the Harm Reduction Coalition as well is that we have a really great policy and advocacy team headed up by Daniel Raymond, uh, Deputy Director of Policy and Planning, who for years have been doing policy and advocacy work in and around these areas. And we were able to then complement that by bringing capacity building and training and technical assistance to, to help people to then begin to act on that policy and advocacy. Um, so but one, some of the lessons we learned that I want to share with you from doing this work um, I think really go to the core of who we are as harm reductionists. So we, you know, we're going into communities that feel very stigmatized. Uh, people in India have received a lot of press, uh, um, you know, attention. There's, you know, Austin itself. Though at one point, some bright spark decided they should put stop signs at the beginning and the entrance of the of the town to say H uh, HIV here, you know, which then people quickly realized how stigmatizing that was, and they shouldn't do that. But um, so when we're going into communities to provide capacity building, that we're recognizing that especially as outsiders, that we're coming in with that sensitivity and that harm reduction love where we say, we're going to meet you where you are. And we're not going to tell, necessarily tell you how you should and shouldn't be doing this. We're going to give you the information that, about how people do it elsewhere, and we're going to help you build it to you meet the unique needs of your community and your area. 
So being very sensitive to that when we go into those communities. Um, and also, you know, recognizing that when we go into these communities, people in these communities have never had a chance to learn about harm reduction. You know, you hear this saying, you don't know what you don't know. So we were, tr we were going into communities where this was brand new stuff to people. People say really messed up shit in meetings, right? And as harm reductionists, you have to kind of hold that sometimes and be ready to kind of meet them um, with some, I call it the hug slap hug method. So like you hug them in their like, because it comes out an of anxiety. You know, I've sat in community meetings where I've had community members that are like, this is ridiculous. It goes against the grain of common sense. Why would, you know, all the classic stuff we hear as arm addictionists, you're enabling people, right? But they've never had a chance to learn about actually what it is we are enabling, right? That we're enabling people to be safer, we're enabling people to help be healthier, and we're enabling people to have the tools to keep themselves alive so that they have a chance to get to recovery. So it, again, as a harm reductionist, it's going into these communities and being ready for that, and being ready to help people understand what we're really about. So we did a lot of work. I even had staff sitting in trainings that had been told by their manager, oh, you're gonna start doing syringe exchange, and they knew nothing about it. You know, I had one lady, in Louisville, who her only job in public health was to go and test the, the water in swimming pools to see if it was safe or not. And suddenly she'd been told, oh, you're going to do syringe exchange. So, so, you know, we have to be, you know, very, um, by providing this capacity building to help people kind of reassure them and gain the confidence that what they're doing is not enabling. Because that's what I was told 20 years ago, and I didn't have the vocabulary to explain why it felt right. Luckily now, 21 years ago, I, I, you know, 21 years on, I can. So, um, so what we were often doing in as part of that is helping people to build their case because local people who felt like they needed to do this or they wanted to do it or you know they were coming to harm reduction for the first time they needed a lot of support to build their case so providing them with the data and the tools uh, and you know and there's this there is this conflict right we feel like why the heck should we spe be spending more money on researching stuff that's already been researched and we've proved that it works but some of the challenges that people face in these very conservative areas is that they have legislators that were like well that research Research is from 2002, right? We want to see more, you know, up-to-date research. So there is a place, I think, for continuing to provide some updated research to support people in these areas to show that it is still working and it is still evidence-based. Um, you know, helping them to learn that, uh, and, and uh, you know, have I used to, I said to them, you know, you need this data in your back pocket when you're speaking to people in the community. Um, and you know, it, it's been amazing to see some of the transformations. I've seen people in community meetings do 180s or even 360s, we, we were at a community meeting in Kentucky where by providing this education and this information at, at, at a very grassroots community level in a local church, I saw a pastor that was completely against harm reduction decide that by the end of the meeting he wanted the syringe exchange van to come and park in his parking lot. I saw a community member that was totally against it and by the end of the meeting he was getting a, a sharps container to go and pick up the needles that he'd seen in, in the back of his, you know, behind his house that he was really worried about. He was almost like a volunteer for the syringe exchange. So, you know, being, by being able to provide this information, we can help people make, you know, really come to harm reduction, truly understand and dispelling some of the myths, right, that, that you know, a lot of people think that abstinence, we're the opposite of abstinence, helping to people to understand that abstinence is a huge part of our spectrum, but we offer many different goals for people in recovery, not, we're not just hinged on that. Um, some of the other things that were really important to our work were also helping the staff um, to understand, uh, especially in health departments, and some of um, the impact of stigma. Um, so we're seeing um, a lot more health departments coming to harm reduction now. Uh, and the staff there, um, the, especially those that are newer to harm reduction, really understanding that you can't just necessarily open up the doors of a building without understanding the stigma that gets in the way of people walking through the doors. So helping people to understand what that means, or people thinking that people will just roll their sleeves up and show me their track marks, understanding that the shame and the stigma that prevents people from doing that, you know, and what it takes to create the engagement and the relationships that you need to get people into your services is a really fundamental part. And a lot of the health departments that we've worked with, uh, you know, most recently we were, we were in Nevada and Utah, they were like, the stigma piece was really key for us to really understand this stuff. So really helping people to understand that when we're doing this capacity building is important. Uh, and I think the other thing that for us as harm reductionists is really important when we're doing this work is helping people to understand the history. When I'm sat in a room of health department folks who are new, you know, who are new to this, helping them to understand that, you know, this did not come out of public health. 
This came from people who use drugs, help, you know, for people who use drugs, and that's the history of our movement, it's the history of our work. So helping them to understand that, so helping them to then understand why it's really important that as you develop these programs, wherever you are, that you include the voice of people who use drugs, that they their expertise should be at the forefront of your planning and development. And also helping them to understand the communities that have been disproportionately affected, right? We've heard a lot about that. Communities of colour that for years have been struggling with this, they developed their own harm reduction because nobody else was willing to provide it for them. And helping, you know, when I'm sat in a room, I was sat in West Virginia with a group of folks, all white folks, and I'm like, how are you going to connect with the communities of colour where you are, who've been experiencing this for years, and now suddenly, because middle class white kids are dying, you want to do something about it? How are you going to address that with those communities too? Who are you going to connect with and create partnerships and alliances with to help you reach those folks too? Similarly, we were in Florida recently. They've, they've just opened their first syringe exchange in Miami, and they know they're struggling. To, they're actually in a community of colour, and they're seeing more white people even though they know that there's people in that community that need them, because there's a huge distrust amongst those communities because of the way of that they've been historically treated. So helping people to understand that in terms of their program development. Um, and then um, the, other, the other important part is, especially when we're seeing a lot more health departments and public health folks coming to harm reduction, that we help them to understand that it's still really important that they partner with community-based organizations and grassroots organizations in terms of delivering this work. Um, because you know, often the community-based organisations are the ones that may already have the pre-existing relationships with folks that are using drugs because they may be accessing them for other services. Um, so that as health departments, it's key that you include and partner with them. We've also seen situations, for example, in Indiana, where you've got really small health departments working in these counties. That sometimes they have one and a half staff, and suddenly they're tasked with a public health emergency. So it's imperative that they partner with other organisations. So, for example, in Bloomington, Indiana, the health departments there decided, you know what, we're not going to do this, we're going to, we, they often hold the power of approved, getting it approved, so they'll have that power to get it approved, but they, you know, they decided to partner with a local community-based organisation that's actually now covering three counties, because they are a better place to do it, uh, you know, and in a time when resources at the state and the federal level may even be getting less, that's becoming more important, because sometimes community-based organisations do not only have the relationships, but the resources to be able to do this. And then um, also helping people to understand, because a lot of harm reduction and the work that we've done has come out of urban areas, and we're seeing a lot more rural areas that are being impacted for the first time. So helping them to explore the unique ways that they need to deliver syringe exchange and harm reduction services. So helping them to understand that you know you might be able to open a storefront, but you, you really need to think about mobile provision and secondary provision by having peer-based uh, um, distribution. and. Um, one of the other things is, um, one of the key things, and I heard this through some of our other speakers actually, you know, thinking about Morocco where they have the regional training center. One of the things we've really focused on is creating training of trainer opportunities. Because we can go in and we can provide this capacity building, but we want people to be able to do it for themselves. So really be, by being able to train people in those local areas who can become those harm reduction trainers um, there, that gives them more capacity to sustain what they're doing. Um, so. I want to just say, I hope what I've shared with you, in light of all the challenges that we're facing, right, and even in America right now, where we have bonkersville at the, at the, um, at this, uh, the national level, right, <laughs> that by doing capacity building with people on the ground at a local and state level, we can, we can still foster the resistance that Deborah spoke about this morning, right? There is hope out there. There are people that are committed to doing this on the ground, and so if we continue to support them to do it, we can hopefully mitigate some of the challenges that we're seeing on a more national level in terms of conservative governments. So, thank you. <laughs>